What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about heart failure. This is going to be, again, within our clinical medicine section. If you guys really like this video and it helps you, please support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and most importantly, subscribe. Also, if you guys want some great notes, some great illustrations to follow along with, go down in the description box below, check out our link. It'll take you to our website. We have a lot of great stuff there. Also, if you guys are interested, we are actually developing a course for the USMLE Step 2 and pants that'll cover all of this in great detail. Go check that out as well. And check out the merch. We got some great stuff. Please go to our website, check out all this stuff, get yourself some swag. All right, let's start talking a little bit about CHF or heart failure, congestive heart failure, many different terminologies there. When we talk about heart failure, the first thing I want to talk about is the pathophysiology behind it. And really, there's a couple different types of heart failure, believe it or not. There's left heart failure, right heart failure, and this weird one called high output failure. We're going to talk first about left heart failure, which is going to be by far the most common type of heart failure. Now, when we talk about left heart failure, we want to think about two different types or subtypes, if you will, of left heart failure. There's what's called systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure. Now, what would cause this patient who has a normal heart to start diverting its way into developing systolic heart failure? The primary reason why this would develop is a patient would have a reduction in their contractility. So the contractility of the left ventricular myocardium is going down. So there's a drop in the contractility. So then you have to ask yourself the question, what is causing this left ventricular myocardium to not contract? What are the disease processes which would lead to this? So here, we're gonna say that this myocardium here, this left ventricular myocardium is damaged in some way, shape, or form, and the contractility here is knocked down. What's some causes? One of the most common causes here by far is going to be a myocardial infarction. If a patient had an MI, it's gonna cause fibrosis of that tissue. Do you lose, you lose contractility there? That's one way. Another one, believe it or not, is cardiomyopathies. You know which one particularly is very, very commonly associated with this one? It's called dilated cardiomyopathy. Because what happens is the, the actual ventricles get really, really thin and very weak. That's another one where the contractility goes down. Another one could be myocarditis, but it's relatively uncommon, but we'll put that one down as well. So another one could be myocarditis, so inflammation of the myocardium. But all of these things would be stimulatory factors that could lead to systolic heart failure, where the contractility is just not good. If the contractility of the heart is not good, particularly the left ventricle, can it push blood out of the left ventricle and into the aorta very well? No. And so this is where the issue occurs, is that the patient has a hard time being able to pump blood out of the heart. So it's a problem with forward flow. There's a very important kind of like formula, we're not gonna go crazy into it, but it helps us determine something called the left ventricular ejection fraction. And this is a very important terminology. So in this person who has systolic heart failure, sometimes what happens is, is as you drop the contractility as you drop the contractility, you drop what's called the left ventricular ejection fraction, which is basically the amount of blood that you're able to pump out of the heart, right? And so when this happens, a decrease in left the contractility, when that happens, that goes down, you drop your left ventricular ejection fraction. And now it's hard being able to get blood out of the heart. When that happens, what we do is we have a very specific terminology whenever the patient has a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, particularly, particularly when it's less than 40%. You know what we call that? We call that heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. We call this HEFREF. <laughs> and that's usually when it's less than 40%. So when the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 40%, we call that HEFREF, which is a, another way of describing systolic heart failure. But the whole point here that I want you to understand is contractility is down. The amount of blood getting out of the heart is down. So what is that called when the volume of blood that you're supposed to be pumping out of the heart in one minute goes down? That's cardiac output. So in these patients, they will start to experience a drop in their cardiac output, which we're going to abbreviate CO. And that's the big highlighting factor here for systolic heart failure or HEFREF heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction. Their causes, drop in contractility due to these can diseases. Now, when we come over here to the other flavor of left heart failure, diastolic heart failure, this is another really, really common one. The problem here is something different. 
in the sense that it is really hard to get blood out of the heart. And there's a couple ways that blood leaves the heart, right? So we call that like stroke volume, the amount of blood that you're kind of getting out of the heart in one heartbeat. That's dependent upon preload, contractility. And what's the last one? Afterload. When the afterload is crazy high in these patients, it's hard for them to get blood out of the heart. And that's usually the problem here, is that these patients develop a massive increase in their afterload. What are diseases that would really kind of increase the afterload and cause these particular types of problems? Chronic hypertension. Can't say how common that particular etiology is. That is probably gonna be by far one of the most common causes. So this would be a chronic hypertension. We'll put chronic here. What's another one? You know there's a valve right here, right? There's a valve right here called the aortic valve, the aortic semilunar valve. What if that valve is super, super stenotic? And because it's crazy, crazy stenotic, it's almost hard, it's kind of obstructing the forward flow. That would also cause a lot of afterload. Aortic stenosis is another really common cause here. So another disease would be called aortic stenosis. This is another very, very common cause for an increase in afterload. It's basically anything that's gonna make it harder for the blood to get out of the left ventricle. These two things, by far, are gonna be the most common thing that'll cause diastolic heart failure. Now in systolic heart failure, what do you notice about the ventricle? Super dilated, right? So let's actually write that over here. So this is a very dilated, enlarged ventricle. What you're gonna notice here is that this is super hypertrophied. This ventricle is very hypertrophied. So you have what's called hypertrophy. It's a very thick, and large left ventricle. We call that left ventricular hypertrophy, or sometimes abbreviated LVH. Now, the reason why is, think about this. If the pressure in the actual aorta is so high that you have to overcome it, what, what's the one way that you can do that? Get stronger and thicken up the left ventricle. But when you do that, when you thicken up this left ventricle and you make it to where you're actually able to generate higher stroke volumes, the problem is now is that you decrease the actual space of the left ventricle. And now, my problem is that I can't get the dang blood into the left ventricle. I can't fill it properly. And so this issue is a filling issue. This was a forward flow issue. So what do I notice here in this particular disease process? The problem with diastolic heart failure is that they have a reduction in their filling process. So there's a decrease in their left ventricular filling. And because I can't fill the ventricles very well, that's gonna cause a problem. Now here's the thing, their left ventricular ejection fraction is completely fine. It's usually completely preserved. So this filling process won't affect their ejection fraction. So their left ventricular ejection fraction is usually what we refer to in this case as normal. Or let's use the term preserved. And so that's where we get this term, a heart failure with a lowercase p preserved ejection fraction where if we were to give it a particular number, it's at least greater than 40%. So in these patient populations with diastolic heart failure, their filling is reduced because their ventricles super, super hypertrophied. That causes their left ventricular ejection fraction to be preserved, and they have what's called a half pef But here's the question. This has a low cardiac output because of low contractility. This will also have a low cardiac output. Do you guys know why? Why this one will have a low cardiac output? This will have a low cardiac output because, again, think about your physiology, guys. It's very, very important to understand physiology here. If I have a decreased filling, I'm not going to load my ventricle very well. So my preload's gonna drop. If my preload drops, what happens to my stroke volume? That goes down. If stroke volume goes down, what happens to my cardiac output? That goes down. So both of these patients will have a low cardiac output. But the primary difference here is that this is a preserved EF because they have no problem with their ejection fraction, no contractility problem. This one has a reduced ejection fraction because they have a contractility problem. Dilated ventricle, hypertrophied ventricle. Super high yield, can't forget these things. Understanding the causes is high afterload, understanding the causes is contractility problem. Okay, now we get into something that I think is really, really important and I think can often be overlooked. When patients develop heart failure because of these issues, it can continue to get worse and worse 
and worse if not treated. Let me explain why. When cardiac output goes down, this is gonna go back a little bit to your physiology here. When cardiac output goes down, what we know is there's always that formula. Do you guys remember the formula uh, for blood pressure? The formula for blood pressure is you have this one here. That blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. In patients who have heart failure, what's the problem here? Their cardiac output drops. And then if you were to say keeping this normal or constant, what would happen to their blood pressure? That would also drop. So then what's the general compensatory mechanism that our body tries to create? We'll do this in pink. SVR has to go up. And so this is usually what ends up happening to the body, is the body creates this weird mechanism to try to increase your systemic vascular resistance, which causes a lot of problems. Let's see what that looks like. So the reason why you may be like, Zach, I really don't want to know this. This is kind of like foundational stuff. It's very helpful for your pharmacology and understanding, I promise. So here, cardiac output's low. Normally what this will do is a couple different things. You know there's uh, those baroreceptors? And baroreceptors are located in like your, your carotids, like right at the bifurcation or at the aorta. And they sense changes in cardiac output and blood pressure. And so what happens is, you're gonna stimulate these things called baroreceptors. And they're gonna go and they're going to activate your sympathetic nervous system. When your sympathetic nervous system becomes crazy activated, it's then gonna jack up all your epinephrine and norepinephrine release. So then what you're gonna see is you're gonna see a lot of epinephrine and you're gonna see a lot of norepinephrine increasing. Why is that a problem? Well, the reason why that's a problem is, is that these little chemicals here, they love to go to the heart and to your vessels and cause some problems. They go to the heart and they say, hey, why don't you speed up the heart rate? Because if you speed up the heart rate, that'll increase the stroke volume, and hopefully increase the critic output. But it's not good for a patient's heart rate to be super high. But that's one of the potential compensations is you're gonna increase the patient's heart rate. Oops, sorry guys. You're gonna increase the heart rate. And again, this is because it acts on what's called beta-1 receptors. This is gonna become helpful, I promise. The other thing is it acts on other types of receptors, like alpha-1 receptors on your vasculature and causes it to constrict. And if you constrict these vessels, what happens to the diameter of them? They get smaller. What happens to the resistance? It goes up. So my SVR will go up. And if that happens on the artery side, what's that gonna do to my afterload? It's gonna go up. And so it increases the afterload. Now you're like, that sounds like a terrible thing. It is terrible. Because, think about this. If a patient has diastolic heart failure and you increase their afterload, what are you gonna do? You're gonna worsen their diastolic heart failure because now if their afterload's high, what does their body try to do to compensate? It hypertrophies and it's gonna worsen their already present heart failure. So this is going to be, it's gonna trigger hypertrophy. And guess what that's gonna do? That's gonna worsen their heart failure and they're gonna get sicker and their heart failure is gonna get worse. The other thing it's gonna do is it's gonna constrict the veins because there's alpha-1 receptors on both the arteries and there's alpha-1 receptors on both the veins. So it's gonna squeeze the veins and try to push a lot of blood back to the heart. And that's gonna try to increase the preload. But then if you increase the preload, now the ventricles have to dilate to accommodate for that volume. And if the ventricle dilates, what does that sound like? Systolic heart failure. So it's gonna worsen the patient's systolic heart failure. So this is why it sounds like these things are kind of like a good mechanism to try to increase your SVR. That's what it's trying to do, is increase the SVR to increase your blood pressure, right? But unfortunately, it worsens the patient's heart failure and their heart rate. Another thing, if that wasn't enough, is this cardiac output's gonna stimulate these like weird cells in the kidney called juxtaglomerular cells. And these juxtaglomerular cells are very sensitive to blood pressure. And what they'll do is, they'll release a molecule called, you guys already know this, right? Renin, all right? So it's gonna release a molecule called renin. Now, renin will then do what? It'll then lead to the formation of angiotensin one. Angiotensin one will then lead to the formation of angiotensin two. What's the enzyme that stimulates that process? ACE, don't forget that. Angiotensin two can do a couple things, but one of those things, 
is it increases aldosterone release from the adrenal gland, and it also increases ADH release from the posterior pituitary. Now, with all of this being said, what's the overall effect of all of this? I'll show you. Angiotensin II works on your vessels. You get a lot of angiotensin II receptors on your, your vessels. So here, let's say we have what's called a angiotensin II receptor here in your vessels. Guess what it does? Squeezes the heck out of them. What did that do? SVR goes up, because that's the compensatory mechanism. If SVR goes up, then what happens to your afterload? That goes up. What happens if you have diastolic heart failure? You worsen the hypertrophy. Patient's getting sicker, that's not helpful. What happens if you do to the preload? You're gonna cause more blood to get returned to the actual heart. Preload goes up, but in a patient who has systolic heart failure, what is it gonna do? It's gonna dilate their heart even more and worsen it. So you guys get the concept here is that this is another potential problematic issue that can worsen the patient's heart failure. And that's why we have drugs that we'll talk about a little bit later that I'm gonna kind of preemptively kind of covering here that this will help to treat. Because we just don't want to have these high angiotensin II levels, the high sympathetic nervous system activity. And just to complete this concept, aldosterone and ADH will be higher. And you know what this does? This increases your reabsorption. Now the patient's reabsorbing lots of sodium and water. And if you reabsorb sodium and water, what is that gonna do? It's gonna cause the patient to retain a lot of this fluid and they're gonna start developing edema. They'll have more preload, so the ventricles will have to dilate more. But one of the problems that you'll see here is they'll start developing a lot of edema because of this. So this is the concept that I really, really want you guys to be able to understand here with this nasty disease process. There's one more thing which is actually super cool though. So this system here is called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, right? You know whenever your heart, your cardiac output's really, really low? Another really interesting thing that happens is, is that your heart, whenever it's like really low cardiac output, the hearts actually kind of get filled with blood. And so they can release this molecule in response to a lot of stretch. So let's say that the heart is really, really, really being stretched. It's being stretched a lot. When the heart is being stretched a lot, it makes a molecule called atrial natriuretic peptide. And it makes a lot of it. And the whole point of increasing this atrial natriuretic peptide is it wants to go and inhibit. The hope is that it inhibits angiotensin II. And if I inhibit angiotensin II, I prevent this whole disastrous process from occurring. Well, that's cool. I would really like drugs that increase AMP then. I would really like drugs that decrease angiotensin II, block aldosterone, and block the sympathetic nervous system. And that's what we'll talk about in the treatment section. But this is what I want you guys to understand about left heart failure. Now let's quickly go through right heart failure and high output failure. All right, my friends, so now we gotta talk about right heart failure. So we talked about the left heart failure. The right heart failure is actually a lot easier. When we talk about right heart failure, it's the same kind of concept. We take this normal heart and we jack it up to cause systolic heart failure. Now, when we talk about this, it's again, you're dropping what? The contractility. So what generally drops contractility on that right heart? Well, in the left heart, the most common cause was an MI. Guess what it would be here, an MI, okay? So generally, a right ventricular MI is going to be the most common cause, generally of this systolic right heart failure. So you're dropping the contractility here. And that's leading to the formation of this systolic heart failure. Now again, what you're gonna notice is, is that this puppy's gonna start be getting super dilated, right? So what you're gonna notice is this dilated type of right ventricle. Now, another concept here <clears throat> with this dilated right ventricle here is that your right ventricle, the contractility is reduced. Right, so this whole right ventricle, let's say, is really, really messed up. Because it's messed up, it's gonna have a hard time being able to pump blood out into the pulmonary artery, right? So it's gonna have a hard time with forward flow. So what you'll notice out of these patients is that they're going to have a low right ventricular cardiac output, right, because of the contractility. And so because of that, they're gonna have this low contractility. This is gonna lead to a decrease in there right ventricular ejection fraction. Now we don't generally give these, you know, as we compared prior, 
uh, the heart failure with the reduced ejection fraction, that's primarily only consistent with left heart failure, but again, you can think about it in this particular way. But again, a reduction in contractility will lead to a reduction in the right ventricular ejection fraction. And the problem is that these patients are gonna have a hard time generating a good cardiac output out of the right ventricle. And so that's the concept here. It's pretty straightforward. Something is decreasing contractility because you infarct to the right ventricle. In the other aspect over here, you have something increasing the afterload, right? So if I have something increasing the afterload, in the example for left ventricle, it was hypertension, it was aortic stenosis. For this one, it's anything that increases, I'm gonna put a little parentheses here, anything that increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. So for the art, systemic circulation, it was called systemic vascular resistance. That was hypertension or aortic, aortic stenosis. And this thing, it's anything that causes pulmonary hypertension. So we say this is pulmonary hypertension. And there is different types. We'll talk about this in palm when we go over pulmonary hypertension, but there's type one, which is idiopathic, type two, which is due to left heart failure, type three due to some type of like lung disease, like COPD or interstitial lung disease, type four due to some type of chronic pulmonary emboli, and then type five is there's usually something like sarcoidosis, like something compressing the pulmonary vasculature. But this is the concept I want you to understand. Pulmonary hypertension for right heart failure, systemic hypertension for left heart failure for that diastolic type. Now, what do you notice here about this right ventricle? It's thick, right? So they have some hypertrophy, generally, of that right ventricle. So we could say right ventricular hypertrophy. And this is usually because that ventricle is gonna have to thicken to be able to accommodate the high pressure of the pulmonary vasculature. That's the only way it can do it. And so because of that, it's gonna have a hard time being able to fill with blood. So the problem with this situation here is the same concept. They have a reduction in right ventricular filling, which causes them to have a, again, a normal ejection fraction. They don't have a problem with their ejection fraction. So they have a normal right ventricular ejection fraction. So again, decreased filling process, but normal right ventricular ejection fraction. That's the big kind of thing that I want you guys to understand here. Now, again, remember, both of these are gonna have a reduction in right ventricular cardiac output. It's just, again, the mechanism behind them developing this. All right, that covers this one for right heart failure, the pathophysiology and the causes. What about this weird one? there's this weird entity called high output heart failure. And generally high output heart failure is particularly only consistent with generally left, so the left heart. And what I wanna do quickly is talk about this one. So for the most part, what you've noticed is that when we talked about left heart failure before, is that there was a low cardiac output. And then when you talk about right heart failure, there's a low cardiac output. There's this weird entity in the world where this is called a high cardiac output heart failure. You're like, what? That seems odd. It is weird, but here's, let me, let me kind of explain why this happens. In this patient here, we see that their vessels are super dilated. So they have extremely super vasodilated blood vessels. So what you'll notice here out of these patients is they have a massive vasodilation, all right? And when you vasodilate vessels, that's a big thing. We'll talk about what causes this, but this is massive vasodilation. All right, so there is massive vasodilation here. The question that you have to ask yourself is what's causing these vessels to become super, super dilated? And there's a bunch of different things. One reason is very common is sepsis. Sepsis will cause massive vasodilation. Another one, which is an odd one, is when you have thymine deficiency, such as beriberi. This will, for some reason, cause massive vasodilation. Thyrotoxicosis, so when a patient has thyroid storm, this can also cause massive vasodilation. Other kind of interesting things could be things like AV fistulas, as well as severe, and I mean really, really severe anemia. These are particular things that in these diseases, but I would say sepsis being kind of one of the most common ones, these will cause massive vasodilation. When you massively vasodilate these vessels, what happens to the systemic vascular resistance? Now, sucker's huge. Resistance has gotta be low. So now their systemic vascular resistance 
is crazy, crazy low. Now, go back to that formula. What was the formula called? For everything with low or how, uh, output heart failure, we said that we have blood pressure is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And all of the ones that we talked about, cardiac output was low, which dropped the blood pressure. Now, in this disease process, the systemic vascular resistance is low, which will cause the blood pressure to be low. What has to compensate? The cardiac output. And that's why we call this high output heart failure. So then what happens is when your systemic vascular resistance drops, what it does is it creates a reflex kind of situation here. So what it does, is it'll drop the blood pressure. So the patient's blood pressure may drop. When you drop the patient's blood pressure, what that's gonna do is it's gonna activate the sympathetic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, and that is going to increase the sympathetic nervous system. Now, look at this. If I increase the sympathetic nervous system, that's then going to go and work on the heart. And when it goes and works on the heart, it's gonna work on a bunch of different components here. One is you have your SA node, your AV node, your bundles of Hiss and bundle branches, that's all gonna be activated. And your heart rate is gonna to try to go up because that's gonna hopefully try to increase your cardiac output. And you're gonna contract your heart like a son of a gun. So then on top of that, you're gonna to try to cause the heart to really, really contract and the stroke volume will go up. And both of these are gonna be an attempt to try to push as much blood possible out of the heart. So what you'll notice here is that these patients will have a massive increase in their heart rate and a massive increase in their stroke volume. But here's what's really odd. You would think, okay, these guys are pumping, and I mean pumping blood out of their heart into the coronary, I mean into the systemic circulation. So the cardiac output has to be high enough, right? It's gotta be good enough to be able to meet the actual tissue demands. It's not. And that's where the problem here in the cycle occurs. This disease causes vasodilation, leads to this whole process, tries to increase the cardiac output, but no matter what, it's not enough to meet the body's demands. And so what happens here is it's not enough. And that's the issue. So you see how when we talk about heart failure, it's the inability to perfuse the tissues and meet their demands. That would be a definition then. So high output heart failure is the cardiac output's high, but it's not high enough to overcome this massive vasodilatory effect to meet the tissue's oxygen demands, and that is heart failure. So, so far we've gone over left heart failure, low output, right heart failure, low output, and the rarity of high output heart failure. Now let's go over what are the complications of a patient developing heart failure. All right, my friends, so now if a patient has left heart failure, whether that's diastolic or systolic heart failure, or right heart failure, whether it's systolic or diastolic heart failure, we have to understand the particular complications that can arise. When a patient has left heart failure, one of the big things that you'll see with these patients is features of pulmonary congestion. So either way, the patient's cardiac output stinks. They're not able to enough, get enough blood out of their left ventricle. So what happens is because they have a cardiac output that is being reduced, if you will, in other words, in these patients, it's hard to get the blood out of the heart. Because of why? Because they have a reduced cardiac output. Now, because of that, if the blood can't get out of the heart, where's it gonna go? It's gonna start backing up into the left atrium. When it backs up into the left atrium, it goes into all of these like cute little pulmonary veins here. You see it starts moving into the pulmonary veins. And then what happens is it starts kind of like congesting these pulmonary veins intensely. Now, when the pulmonary veins start coming very, very filled with all of this blood, the pressure in those go up. And we specifically use a terminology here called pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So we'll use that on both of these here. And this will go up, and the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a measure of left heart pressures. So if the left heart pressure is high, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressures will also be high. When that happens, the pressure in the pulmonary capillaries rise enough that guess what starts leaking out of this actual vasculature? Fluid. So you're gonna have fluid leaking out of this vasculature and into the interstitial spaces, and into the alveoli. So now this alveoli is gonna become filled with fluid. You're gonna develop some edema here in the interstitial spaces, 
and now these patients have pulmonary edema. And so this is one of the potential complications is they get a little bit of pulmonary edema. Now why is that bad? When you have pulmonary edema, some patients can present a couple different ways. One is they particularly present with what's called dyspnea. Now dyspnea, it may just be a generalized dyspnea. This may be with exertion, this may be at rest. And that depends upon the severity of their CHF. But another very interesting presentation is that whenever these patients lie flat, the fluid tends to kind of like, kind of separate out into multiple parts of the lungs. Normally they'll be in the dependent inferior portions, but as you lay flat, this edema can become worse and spread throughout multiple alveoli. And this can worsen their actual shortness of breath when they're laying flat. And so there's two terminologies. One is called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. This is whenever they're, at, they're asleep and they're laying flat, they're super short of breath. Or just in general, maybe they're not sleeping, they're laying down flat or laying on a recliner and they have some shortness of breath there. It's the same concept. It's called orthopnea. These are big, big common features that we see with pulmonary edema. One is just dyspnea, whether it be exertion or rest, or the other one is when they're laying flat. Proxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea. Another potential problem here is that whenever these patients, let's say they really, really have a massive reduction. So let's say that their cardiac output massively reduces, maybe for whatever reason. Common triggers for patients to develop what's called acute decompensated heart failure is they have an MI or they have a massive tachyarrhythmia or they stop taking their, their medications they're supposed to be taking. And what this does is this massively drops the cardiac output, massively increases the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and worsens their pulmonary edema, like terribly. And sometimes this pulmonary edema can be severe. I'm talking severe pulmonary edema. And this is something that we would generally see when a patient has what's called acute decompensated heart failure. And what happens is, is this fluid will really start kind of leak, like all over multiple different alveoli and interstitial spaces will become filled with fluid. And this can cause a massive VQ mismatch. When you fill up multiple alveoli with fluid, that causes a VQ mismatch. Decrease in ventilation, normal perfusion, there's a mismatch, and that leads to hypoxemia. So watch out for a VQ mismatch here. And what will happen is the patient's SpO2 will be very low. And they can exhibit features of what's called hypoxia. The other thing is that this fluid that leaks into the interstitial spaces, when it actually does leak there, sometimes it may just cause the patient to have generalized dyspnea or increased work of breathing. So they may be working hard to breathe or they may have a higher respiratory rate. So that's another kind of thing that you wanna watch out for, is watch out for an increased work of breathing or an increased respiratory rate. So these are some of the big findings that you wanna watch out for. So again, watch out for a stimulation of VQ mismatch because of all of these alveoli being filled with fluid and then hypoxia. So watch their O2 sat to see if they have desaturations. This is super, super common in left heart failure. So big things to look out for is go to the patient, see if they have any respiratory distress or hypoxia on their O2 saturation Ask them if you have any shortness of breath at rest, exertion, or when they're laying down flat or when they're sleeping. And the other thing, get your stethoscope that you paid so much money for and go and listen and see if you hear any rails or crackles. All of these are potential signs of pulmonary edema. This is very common in left heart failure. The scariest complication that I say that you would potentially see in a patient who has left heart failure is cardiogenic shock. And this is definitely the scariest one. Generally, again, a very common trigger here and that can happen is an MI, a massive tachyarrhythmia, or you stop taking your medications. These are very, very common triggers. Now, again, same concept. The patient has a massive drop in their cardiac output. If you drop their cardiac output, you're not gonna be getting enough blood flow out of their heart. When you don't get enough blood flow out of the heart, particularly enough volume, you drop that cardiac output, what happens to their perfusion? Oh, that's stinky. That systemic perfusion goes down. So not only whenever you have a low cardiac output, do you have a hard time getting blood out of the heart and it backs up into the lungs, but you have a hard time getting it out of the heart and delivering it to multiple tissues. When you have a decrease in systemic perfusion, 
The problem with this is, is that your body kind of says, okay, perfusion's kind of stinky right now. The cardi that's because the cardiac output's really low. You know what the body tries to do is it says, okay, what I'm gonna do is, if the cardiac output's low, what's that formula? BP is equal to cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. Let's write that out. So BP is equal to cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance. And these patients who are in cardiogenic shock, this is low, causing this to be low. What has to compensate, my friends? SVR, and this will shoot through the roof. And when SVR goes up, it clamps down on your vessels, squeezes them. And now you have very little blood flow going to your extremities. You know what this is gonna do? This is gonna cause these patients to have very cold or pale extremities. Another really, really terrifying sign here is they have like modeling. And this is really, really kind of scary. It's where they have this weird kind of discoloration, usually at the knees. And that's a very uh, sign of, that's a very poor sign of perfusion. And this is usually because you're clamping down on those vessels to compensate. Another thing is that when you have decreased systemic perfusion, not only do you create this reflexive vasoconstriction, but you also get organ malperfusion, right? If I have organ malperfusion, oh man, that ain't good because now I'm not perfusing various tissues. What are some of these tissues that actually become affected because of an increase in more organ malperfusion? One is the brain. The brain is super sensitive to blood pressure. The coronary circulation, which supplies the myocardium of the heart, well, it's gonna make things a lot worse. It becomes very susceptible. The kidneys become susceptible. And the GIT would probably be the last one of the line, but it's also super susceptible. If I don't perfuse the actual brain, no, then I can develop encephalopathy. And this is probably gonna be one of the most common causes. Sometimes, if the actual malperfusion is severe enough, it's possible it could cause a TIA slash CVA. All right, so that's another thing you wanna watch out for. The other thing is that if you don't perfuse the actual myocardium well enough, it may cause a myocardial infarction. So you may see things like an end STEMI or a STEMI potentially. So these are things that I think are really, really important to remember. The other thing is it may stimulate, son of a gun, it may stimulate injury to the kidneys. This is called an AKI. There is a very common terminology that you may hear here. Uh, when patients have very severe left heart failure and they don't perfuse their kidneys very well because of decreased systemic perfusion, but also their CVPs are really high, so it's hard to get blood out of the kidney, they can develop kind of something called cardiorenal syndrome. Very common trigger of AKI, so don't forget that one. And the last one is they may cause acute mesenteric ischemia. This is another really, really big one. Or ischemic colitis. And this is another big trigger, so you're gonna to wanna to watch out for any kind of like bowel ischemia and abdominal pain. The last thing that's always a feature of systemic perfusion that's being very, very poor is your tissues. Whenever there's very little oxygen that's being delivered to the tissues, so here this tissue is supposed to be getting oxygen. If it's getting very, very little oxygen, they do not like that. And what they do is they trigger the production of a molecule that's usually a sign of poor perfusion. You guys know what that's called? Lactic acid. But lactic acid gets broken down into lactate. And so you wanna watch out for this because one of the things that this will do is this will really cause the pH to drop and it'll trigger an acidosis. So watch out for acidoses that can occur in the setting of cardiogenic shock. So again, when a patient has heart failure, it can kind of look a little bit different. The patient may have chronic CHF where their primary symptom may just be dyspnea, proxism nocturnal dyspnea, or orthopnea. But if they develop an acute decompensated heart failure from those triggers, MI, tachyarrhythmias, medication uh, non-compliance, they can develop severe pulmonary edema, hypoxia, respiratory distress. And most patients who have chronic CHF, they may just have minimal decreased systemic perfusion. And the way that they compensate is an increase in systemic vascular resistance. So they may have cold, kind of pale mottled extremities. But whenever it's really bad, to where there is an acute decompensated heart failure due to an MI, tachyarrhythmias, medication non-compliance. Now they don't perfuse multiple organs and they can develop things like encephalopathy, MI, AKI, and acute my, uh, mesenteric ischemia and lactic acidosis. These are big things to think about, my friends. All right, we come to the last one here. Patient has right heart failure, all right? So if the patient has right heart failure, it was because 
they had something wrong with the contractility or the high afterload, pulmonary hypertension. This one's super easy, thank goodness. Whenever the right heart is damaged, what happens is, again, the whole concept here is that it's either you can't fill it or you can't get blood out of it, right? So that's either one of those concepts. You can't get blood in or you can't get blood out of it. When that happens, what happens is the pressure in the right heart increases. And we use a terminology to really describe that, and that's called your central venous pressure. So your central venous pressure becomes very high. When your central venous pressure is high, what happens is the blood is, is kind of a measure of the blood backing up into your superior vena cava and blood backing up into your inferior vena cava. And what this will do is this will kind of present in two different ways that you want to try to look for. One is it'll present with a patient having a lot of jugular venous distension. So they'll have a plump jugular vein. And the other one is they'll have some edema of their lower extremities, usually what's called pitting edema. So when you press on it, it kind of really dips in and gives this kind of deformity there. This is super common in right heart failure. Another common presentation, again, regardless of the type, whether it's a problem filling or problem getting out, the concept is the same, is that you have a very high central venous pressure. When your central venous pressure is high, the blood is gonna back up into the inferior vena cava, and what it does is it causes one particular problem, which it leads to hepatic congestion. So you know the liver, I'm kind of zooming in on a basic model of the liver, let's say this is a liver cell, this is an artery, this is the hepatic veins which empty into the IVC, and this is a biliary duct. Whenever this hepatic vein is congested and it can't get blood to go up, it congests in the liver and causes the liver to become injured and damaged. And you know what this could potentially present as? This could cause a patient to develop liver failure. More specifically, I would say you see this more commonly as a cirrhotic kind of presentation, but you can see this as a potential trigger of liver failure because of the increased hepatic congestion. All right. The other thing that it can do is it can increase your portal pressure. So what happens is your hepatic veins, what happens is it can actually cause this to really cause the portal pressure within the venous circulation, the hepatic portal circulation to become very, very high. So if you increase your portal pressure, what this does is this causes the hydrostatic pressure in the portal veins and the peritoneal capillaries to be super high and leak fluid into the abdomen. And when you leak this fluid into the abdomen, what do we call this type of fluid that leaks into the abdomen? Ascites. And so that's another very, very common presentation here is ascites. So watch out if a patient develops liver failure and they have a history of right heart failure, think about that. If they have ascites and they have a history of right heart failure, think about that. And again, if they have very plump jugular veins and pitting edema, think about a right heart failure. And the last one, it's not commonly thought of, but it can happen. In left heart failure, we talked about cardiogenic shock. Right heart failure can also get cardiogenic shock. So think about this. This concept is super interesting. In this situation here, you're having, let's say, blood difficulty. This is more common in the systolic types, where the vent right ventricle is super dilated. In this situation, you have a problem getting blood out of the right heart. And because of that, now this right ventricle has a hard time if it becomes super dilated. Maybe it can't fill properly or it, it just can't get blood out of the heart. When that happens, because you can't get blood out of the heart, the right ventricle dilates even more. So if it's dilated before, it dilates more. All right? So now this sucker is huge. <laughs> so whenever this happens, you can't get blood out of the heart, it's gonna stimulate the right ventricle to dilate even more. When the right ventricle dilates more, the next thing it does is, is it causes the septum to bow over into the left ventricle. And now look at the space of the left ventricle. It's smaller. So then it causes, it's called a septal shift. So a septal shift. And we'll say that this septal shift is occurring from right to left, from the right side to the left side. What that does is, is it makes it hard for the left ventricle to fill with blood because now it's much smaller. If it can't fill with blood, what happens to the left ventricular cardiac output? It drops. So now you have a septal shift and that's gonna cause 
a decrease in the left ventricular filling. If you decrease the left ventricular filling, that is going to then do what? That is going to decrease the left ventricular cardiac output. And if you decrease the left ventricular cardiac output, oh, son of a gun, that can potentially lead to systemic malperfusion. And then if we go on further, cardiogenic shock. So this is a pretty scary one. I would, I'm actually usually, we don't see this one too often, right heart failure causing cardiogenic shock. But when you do, it's pretty terrifying because it's a really, really bad one. But this is another potential one that I want you to think about, but you really primarily only see this one with right ventricular MI as the particular etiology here. Not so much the pulmonary hypertension causes. All right, my friends, that covers the issues or complications, if you will, of heart failure. It's a pretty disastrous thing if it gets really, really bad. What I wanna do now is I wanna take you through how to diagnose heart failure. First thing is, Get a chest x-ray. This will help you because if they have cardiomegaly, that's somewhat helpful. Do they have pleural effusions, pulmonary edema, and curly B-lines? That's all suggestive of left heart failure for the most part. Now, with that being said, if a patient has these findings that doesn't define or determine that they have heart failure, I want to combine, oh, they have pulmonary edema, pleural effusions. Is their left heart not doing a good job? Well, one way I could say if their heart is not doing a good job is I could check BMP. This is not a good test though. It's usually used in the emergency department to kind of quickly exclude a CHF exacerbation. Because if BMP levels are really low, then you can say, okay, their dyspnea is probably not from a CHF exacerbation. If it is really high, then you can't rule that out. The better test is an echocardiogram because it's gonna look directly at the heart and it's gonna look to say, hey, what's their ejection fraction? Is it less than 40%? Their left ventricle doesn't look like it's moving at all? That's systolic heart failure. Or does it look like their left ventricle is contracting and pumping, but it's not filling properly? Oh, that's diastolic heart failure. In combination with the chest x-ray, that can be very beneficial. Also do your physical exam. If you don't see anything on the chest x-ray, look at the JVD, look at the legs, look at the, the abdomen to look to see if they have any features of systemic congestion and combine that with their echo. After you've done that, you should be able to determine is it right versus left. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the most definitively diagnostic test to determine if the patient is in acute left heart failure or in left heart failure in general is to do a right heart catheterization, also referred to as a Swan-Gans catheter. You take a catheter, you run it down the IJ, you run it into the pulmonary, uh, into the right atrium, into the pulmonary artery, and up into these like pulmonary artery capillary areas. Inflate the balloon and then measure the pressures. I told you that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, if it's really high, that's very suggestive of a failure of the left heart. <clears throat> and if it's greater than 18 millimeters of mercury, that's a very suggestive number of left heart failure. So if a patient has elevated BMP levels, an echo, and a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure greater than 18 in combination with a chest x-ray suggestive of pulmonary edema, I can really be confident in them having left heart failure. Now, with that being said, if a patient has acute left heart failure, it's important to go through their medication list and look to see what their heart rate is and look to see if they have any valvular disturbances. But one of the big ones that I have to do is get an EKG and also consider a left heart cath if I think they're having an MI because that's going to find the occlusion and then treat that. And that might be the thing that knocks them out of this acute heart failure potentially. All right, how do we treat heart failure? This is a really, really important topic. When I treat them, I specifically went into this for a reason. I want to reduce sympathetic nervous system activity, reduce RAS activity, and increase AMP activity. And if you remember, increasing AMP activity did what? Decrease RAS. So my goal is to decrease sympathetic, increase, uh, decrease sympathetic, and decrease RAS. How do I do that? Well, if I decrease my sympathetic nervous system, I have to use things like beta blockers and SGLT2 inhibitors. So metoprolol, carvedilol, or uh, empagliflozin. Uh, usually these SGLT2 inhibitors are very, very important in patients with diabetes, but if they have cardiovascular disease, it's also beneficial. And what happens is they reduce the sympathetic nervous system. That reduces the heart rate, and that also reduces the systemic vascular resistance. I don't constrict the veins. I don't constrict the arteries as much. I don't reduce, uh, I don't actually cause changes in preload and afterload, and I don't cause ventricular remodeling. That improves ventricular function. That's mortality beneficial right there. The other thing is that SGLT2 inhibitors also cause aquaiuresis. They cause you to pee out of tons of water. And so that can help with a lot of the edema if the patient is edematous. The next concept is I want to reduce RAS activity. So the reason why is whenever I have low cardiac output, again, we said increase sympathetic and low cardiac output activate renin. So renin leads to eventually 
angiotensin 2. But if I give them a drug called an ACE inhibitor that blocks angiotensin 1 from being converted into angiotensin 2. If I also give them a drug like an ARNI that increases AMP, it prevents AMP from being degraded. If AMP builds up, it shuts down angiotensin 2. And then if I also give an ARB, ARB blocks angiotensin 2 from binding to receptors. All three of these drugs will help to decrease angiotensin 2. If I decrease angiotensin 2, I reduce the constrictions of the arteries and the veins, and I reduce ventricular remodeling, and that's a mortality benefit. Another thing is angiotensin 2, if there's less of it, there's less aldosterone and also ADH. But particularly aldosterone, because now there's less sodium and water retention. If I don't retain as much sodium and water, I don't have as much edema, but I also don't have as much preload, and I don't cause ventricular remodeling. That's where aldosterone antagonists would be really, really beneficial in shutting down aldosterone production. This is the concept, and these are the drugs that we have to incorporate in patients who have heart failure because they have mortality-reducing benefits. Okay, that's a part of our guideline-directed medical therapy. Other things that we can add on with guideline-directed medical therapy is alternatives. So if a patient's African-American that can't tolerate an ACE inhibitor and ARB, hydralazine and isosorbidinitrate is a good combo to add because they're good vasodilators. The other one is an alternative to a beta blocker if they're maxed on a beta blocker and they are in normal sinus rhythm, ivabrating can be considered. If you want to help them to get rid of a lot of the sodium and water retention, you can make them pee it out by giving them diuretics, loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics. And then the next thing is if a patient has the need for device therapy. So what I mean by this is if a patient has heart failure, especially left heart failure, it stretches out the left ventricle and kind of causes left bundle branch blocks. And then that alters the synchrony of the ventricles. If I give them what's called a CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy, it'll make sure that the ventricles are contracting kind of in tandem and improve potentially the left ventricular ejection fraction. I should definitely be instituting that in patients with an LVEF less than 35% and an LVB, B, all right? That's a CRT. If a patient has a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35% and they have ventricular arrhythmias, they need to get an AICD. This will shock them if they go into VTAC or into VFib and prevent them from going into cardiac arrest. The next thing is if a patient is on all of these medications, they have device therapy, their left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 25%, they're not looking good and they look like they're gonna need a transplant, sometimes we will play something called an LVAD, a left ventricular assist device, which will take blood from their left ventricle and shunt it a different direction into the aorta to give that left ventricle some time to rest. Now, in patients who are in cardiogenic shock, all right, their systemic perfusion stinks. I want to have one primary goal, which is to increase systemic perfusion. So increasing systemic perfusion is very beneficial in patients who are in cardiogenic shock. So what could I do? Inotropes or mechanical circulatory support. One way I can do that is I can give them things like dobutamine or milrinone. These are commonly used in acute decompensated heart failure or cardiogenic shock. The benefit of these is that they reduce afterload and increase contractility, which combined increase cardiac output. The downside is that evidence has shown no reduction in mortality. The other drug is digoxin. This is an oral and IV drug, so you can take this outpatient. You can't take these outpatient. This you can give to the patient, and it's been shown to increase contractility and decrease AV node conduction, so it's good in atrial fibrillation as well. It is not shown to reduce mortality, but it may reduce the actual hospitalizations. So there's a potential benefit to digoxin and increasing perfusion, especially in patients with cardiogenic shock and even as an outpatient continuing that drug. If the patient is failing these inotropes and they're continuing to decompensate and showing signs of potential failure, then we go to device therapy. And there's two ways that we could go here. An intraortic balloon pump has been shown to at least preserve coronary perfusion. So this sucker deflates during systole to get blood to go forward. And then it actually inflates during diastole. So here during diastole, it, it inflates and it keeps the pressure all here in the aorta really high. And what that does is guess what comes right off of the aorta here, the coronary arteries. So if the pressure is high in the aorta during diastole, it's gonna improve coronary perfusion and improve myocardial contractility. And that's the benefit of this. Most times, patients who end up on cardiogenic shock refractory to a lot of medications, uh, such as dobutamine, milrinone, um, intraortic balloon pumps may require something called VA ECMO. Uh, this is called venal arterial extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. We take a catheter, we run it into one of their veins, we run it out of the vein and into a pump, 
From there, we run it through an oxygenator, and then we put it in a catheter that runs right into their artery. These are big stinking catheters, and they are designed to be able to help to maintain a decent amount of flow and augment the cardiac output and also oxygenate the blood. So this is a potential beneficial therapy that could be used as a patient in refractory cardiogenic shock. The other thing I think is important to remember in a patient who's in cardiogenic shock or having any signs of uh, cardiogenic pulmonary edema is what's called BiPAP. Using diuretics to help to get rid of some of the sodium and water, which will help to reduce some of that actual di- uh, pulmonary edema, but BiPAP has been shown to potentially increase the intrathoracic pressure, and that will help to reduce right ventricular preload, so you don't have as much blood going to the right heart, and you don't have as much blood going out of the right heart. So now less blood is going through the pulmonary circulation and going to the left heart. If there's less blood, less blood going that way, that's going to have less blood leaking out into the pulmonary interstitium, less pulmonary edema. The other concept is it drops your left ventricular afterload. So the pressure in the aorta drops. So it's easier to get blood out of the left ventricle into the aorta. So you have less blood coming to the left heart and you have more blood going out of the left heart. That's going to improve your cardiac output and reduce pulmonary edema, but more particularly reduce pulmonary edema. And that's one of the benefits of this drug in patients who are in acute heart failure or uh, potentially cardiogenic shock. All right, I know this is a lot. Let's go through this in a systematic approach. A patient comes in, they have heart failure, you've changed their modifiable risk factors. After that, you start them on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, all right, plus a beta blocker. They're still symptomatic, give them diuretics to reduce venous congestion, whether it's systemic or pulmonary. They're still symptomatic, add on aldosterone antagonists and an SGLT2 inhibitor. They're still symptomatic and they're potentially unable to tolerate an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. Well, switch them. Switch to an ARNI if possible, so an angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. So this would be things where you put them on like Secubitril, um, Valzartan. So these are very good drugs that have been shown to be very beneficial. The other thing is if they can't do that one, or if they're African American, consider hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate. It actually has a mortality benefit. If the patients are symptomatic on all these therapies and in normal sinus rhythm maxed out on a beta blocker, give them ivibrating. If the patient has a left ventricular ejection fraction less than 35% and a left bundle branch block or a QRS greater than 120, give them cardiac resynchronization therapy. If despite all of these measures, they remain symptomatic, try to increase their perfusion. Usually inotropes would be the next step here. So digoxin would probably be the one that you'd want to continue outpatient. If they're in overt cardiogenic shock, milrinone or dobutamine, And then from there, if you have to, mechanical circulatory support if they're in overt cardiogenic shock, intraortic balloon pumps, VA ECMO, hopefully they recover. And then the thing that you would need to put them on to bridge them to a transplant is an LVAD. And hopefully they would get a cardiac transplant and improve. All right, my friends, that covers heart failure. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. 